You're listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Here are your hosts, Fran Chismar and Tom Knezic. Welcome back to the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast presented by Pinelands Nursery. I am Fran Chismar. And I am Tom Knezic. And I remember what episode number we're on this time. It is episode number 68. Wait, did you remember or did you look? No, I remembered. I, I actually remembered it's guess. You remember the look? Are, are even. And I did remember the look. Yeah, guess are even. And then our buzz episodes are odd. So no uh, flubbing through the, the episode number like I, I had in the last couple of weeks. I keep skipping ahead in, in my mind that we're like way further ahead you're about to have a catastrophe behind Uh-oh. you like i'm watching it like slouch down <laughs> tom tom has like a i'll go fix it tom tom <laughs> has uh something he he has a window right behind him and even though we have a blind the sun still kind of goes through so he puts in something to block it and every now and then during a podcast it 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 slumps down and, and crashes but i think we caught it ahead of time so we're uh, excited to be up to episode 68. Tom's back, so I'll let him. Yeah, so, um, oh, where was I, Fran? I can't believe you just threw it, it to me it like was that. Number, well, but, we were saying we're at episode Yeah, it was, and I was really surprised. So we we gave a presentation to the Middle Tennessee chapter of Wild Ones last, last night. night. Last night, yeah. And, uh, which was really, really awesome. We Basically, we have a presentation that is not just, it's really not that plant-focused. It's more getting other people that aren't interested in native plants to get them interested in native plants and ways to tie make that circle bigger like we always talk about you know one of the the more difficult things is when you're asked to talk at a lot of these organizations tom and i actually have a lot of talks coming mm-hmm. up in the next two to three months you're already preaching to the choir and that's the hard thing what are you going to sit down right. and and tell everyone that they don't already know they that's why they're there but how do you get more people in the seats how do you get more people involved how do you What's the gateway to get more people to listen to what you're throwing down? Mm-hmm. And that's really what the, the the talk is. And I think that's something we stumbled yeah. upon by accident with the podcast. Oh, yeah. And but with all the presentations we do, I kind of use some of the like, copy of the slides from the end because the end is like, OK, here's our website. Here's our YouTube channel. Here's, yeah. here's our podcast. And I, I threw it up there. and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's like episode six and seven. <laughs> so they were pretty old. So. I uh, should probably update that for, for future presentations. So it yeah. reflects that we've been doing this for more than a few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. You did at least have, you picked one with great guests. Yes. So oh, yeah. that's, that's important. So when today's guest is another great guest and one we've been uh, wanting to have on for a long, long time. Again, since, we reference our original we list. Started, yeah. Or before we started, we had that original list and this was one of the people that was on there and we're really happy we we're able to do it like a year and a half into this yeah but um and that is sam hoadley from mount cuba center and you'll probably remember we had another guest from mount cuba center on a, a couple weeks ago with uh, nate champagne and um and with mount cuba lands. is doing so much different stuff there uh and even with that original list we're, like, we're probably gonna have to do like four or five episodes it, just yeah. on mount cuba so. definitely sam why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself how you got into the role you're currently in at mount cuba and um and then get into what the trial gardens are a little bit Sure, absolutely. And thank you guys for having me. It really is a pleasure. Um, uh, It's a tough act to follow Nate, but I'll I'll do my best here. Um, So essentially, I'll start at the beginning. I've always um, been passionate about horticulture and the natural world. I grew up in Connecticut and got my degree in sustainable landscape horticulture from the University of Vermont. Um, After that, I came down. I worked at Longwood Gardens for several years, um, purely in a horticultural um, uh, role there. Um, but I've always been interested in the wildlife piece of things. And even there, um, I kind of like to experiment and tinker in the gardens there. And I think that's what really appealed to me about this role at Mount Cuba Center and what George had built, um, George Coombs, uh, my predecessor in the trial gardens, um, he really built the trial program at Mount Cuba Center to what it is today, um, really popularizing our research reports that you may be familiar with. Um, uh, he just did a fantastic job putting Mount Cuba on the map. And I think a lot of people know what Mount Cuba is because of those research reports and the trial garden work that he did. Um, and I use those reports all the time in my previous roles um, and just really admired the work being done. And when I saw George had been promoted um, to director of horticulture here, 
um, I jumped on the, you know, the opportunity to apply and I, I feel so fortunate to have this job. And I've been here for about two and a half years. Um, so far, I've written the reports on uh, Helenium and uh, Echinacea, and we're currently working on our Hydrangea arborescence trial report, which I'm really excited about. It's a really cool pollinator component to that research as well. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my story in a nutshell, I guess. Not super diverse, but um, yeah, I'm glad to be here. You know, it's, I'm, I'm impressed that I, one of my better friends went to University of Vermont. I don't know that he learned anything. I think all he did was ski. <laughs> sure, there's plenty of people who do that. Yep. <laughs> and now he has a farm brewery. So I guess I guess he yeah. did learn something. So there you go. <laughs> he learned to translate drinking beer into a business, which is yeah. <laughs> which is good. Um, so the, for the trial gardens, I guess a little bit of the history. What sparked the the trial gardens? Like, what was the the reasoning for for starting this in the first was it actually a well thought out plan that we should do this or was it something that was being done and maybe some significant discoveries were being made and you know maybe we should publish this sure um so it actually started a long time ago on well not as as far as the history of mount cuba center being a public garden um it's it's a little bit in the past so mount cuba center actually really opened our doors to the public for the first time in 2014. Um, and before that, Mrs. Copeland had really set um, Mount Cuba Center um, on the path of conservation and native plant gardening um, and uh, teaching people about that. And she was really a pioneer um, in that field. Um, and with Dick Lighty, our first director here, um, he helped guide the future of the organization after she passed away in 2001. And one of the first things that was done in 2002 was um, her cut flower garden um, which is now was converted into a trial garden. And when that first happened, it was a bit of a mix of things. Um, there wasn't exactly a big groups of, of plants the way we have today, but it's evolved over the years. There are some older trials even before our first trials on aster um, and, and echinacea. I think Penstemon was one and there were some ones and twos of things in there. Um, but I think it was a lot about trying to determine what would grow well at Mount Cuba Center and using those results um, either for introductions um, or just for informing the garden staff of what could work and what we should be incorporating in the, gar in the garden. And once George kind of got a hold of things um, and we, he released that first report on, um, on uh, Hucro, which he really followed in the footsteps of our first um, uh, trial gardeners where they were looking at Aster and Echinacea. But when we did that report on Hucro, I think it really put the trial gardens on center stage. And that was in the early, um, 2011, something like that. I might be saying the wrong, the wrong year here, but early on in that process. But that was really when things started getting serious as far as trialing bigger genera, um, putting out this research. And then over the years, it evolved to being more than just looking at plants from a garden perspective, but also looking at them from a wildlife perspective. Um, and we're looking specifically at pollinators um, with a lot of our previous reports as well. Mm -hmm. For, for those that don't know Dick Lady, Dr. Dick Lady uh, was a professor at University of Delaware. Um, love of natives, but cultivars as well. I believe he introduced um, Aster Purple Dome. I believe he, uh, that was one of his introductions, but he had a love for for both. And I, I if I remember correctly, I, I worked with, with uh, Dr. Lady's son, Steve. And we had been invited to his property a few times, and there was this like a creek through the property, and one side was natives, and one side was cultivars. You know, just there, there was a love of both there. So uh, it it it's it kind of makes sense to me how that translated to Mount Cuba with with his his being a part of it. Sure. Yeah. And actually, he um, Purple Dome was uh, he introduced while he was here. Um, Sold Ego Golden Fleece, um, Space Lot of Golden Fleece was another one of his intros, um, both early on, or late 80s, early 90s. Um, Aster uh, Bluebird, um, Aster Lady Bluebird was another one that was really early on there uh, under Dick's influence. So, yeah, he's, again, like exactly like you said, um, really interested in the straight species natives, but also interested in introducing um, interesting forms. Uh, plants with unique habits um, as cultivars as well. So as these trials progress, early on, it was more for a, a gardening standpoint, not necessarily a, a wildlife standpoint. Have, 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 has it been thought of to go back or have you already gone back to redo some of those just to see what the wildlife impact is? 
Absolutely. And that actually just happened. So we had a very early trial. Um, Echinacea was one of the first um, genus that we actually really gave a full treatment to. Um, but that was, I think, up between 07 and 09 when that first took place. And at that time, I think we had 48 different echinacea, and we were looking at them purely from a horticultural standpoint, um, mm -hmm. garden value, how they performed in common garden settings. And, and sorry to interrupt, but when you sure. say 48, that's um, across uh, some different species and then cultivars yes. or, or selections of those species, right? Exactly. Yeah, 48 accessions, and that could include species, cultivars, hybrids, you name it. Um, basically, as many plants as we could get our hands on at the time, uh, we included in the trial. And then um, most recently, um, since we since that pollinator component and the wildlife components become more and more important to us and it's becoming more and more central into our, our research in the trial gardens, we felt it was really important to um, give echinacea another treatment. Um, and, and what A, for that reason, and B, because there's been so many plants that have been introduced since the conclusion of that trial. There's just been so many cultivars out in the marketplace and it's almost one of those, those things when there's just so many plants being introduced, by the time you have your research report out, sometimes it's almost obsolete because that's, those plants have already been out for three or four years and there's new plants out. Um, so giving plant, giving genera like echinacea a second treatment, I think made a lot of sense. Um, and it was very important to us to, to add that pollinary component in as well, because we've, we've done that same thing with phlox, um, monarda, um, helenium, and we also did a slightly different um, approach on Coreopsis, which is really interesting. I'm sure we'll get into that as well. But, um, you know, counting those pollinators specifically with, um, with bees and wasps as a category and butterflies as a separate category and looking at the trends um, of the different cultivars and hybrids and species was fascinating. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun and uh, we had some interesting take home messages from the end of that as well. Yeah. You know, and the results for these, there are a lot to go into. They're they're very in depth. So it's not like we're we're kind of glossing over that, but I don't want you to think it's from a standpoint of that it's not important. It's that you could just pick one trial. We could talk about that for, for sure. over an hour. <laughs> over yeah. an hour. For sure. Um, how do you what's well, I have a few questions. I've been writing down furiously. <laughs> sure. so, you know, let how you were saying that um Sometimes by the time you get to publish the report, so many new introductions. Are, are you at the point where breeders will come to you or nurseries will come to you and say, we've been working on this or we have this and we'd like you to do something with it? Like, I, I'm, I'm sure that given what you've been able to accomplish, that people are coming to you asking for input. Yeah, sure. And that, that's happened. Um, in our Coreopsis trial, we had um, some introductions that were included in that from breeders who are kind of on the cutting edge of Coreopsis. Um, there's a few breeders that, that reach out to us or we'll reach out to them and say, hey, you know, we're, we're planning a trial on Vernonia, for example. Do you have anything that you've been working on that you'd like to see included? Um, essentially, when we're planning a trial, we're trying to get as big a view as we possibly can, particularly commercially available plants, but also plants that may not be widely available in the commercial world that we think have potential to be. Um, and uh, yeah, we include those plants. Um, with the breeder's knowledge that our trials are incredibly non-biased. We aren't, um, we're just communicating exactly what we see. Um, sometimes those plants do really well, sometimes they don't. Um, and it's really just, um, you know. It's just reporting the facts. Exactly, exactly. You know, so, yeah. you know, it may not be the result they want, but the result yes, and that's is happened. true, but it's, yep. but, but yep. it's, it's, it is what it is. And it's, mm -hmm. I hate that saying, but I use it all the time. <laughs> I know. I mean, sometimes there's plants in there that I that I love, and I, I know they make good garden are good garden plants in other conditions, um, and they just don't do well. And I have to try to like get my head out of picking favorites and really just report the facts and be much more objective about it. You know, even given the results, so that some things may not perform as well as what is hoped, it doesn't change the fact if you have an emotional tie to it. One of sure. the things that we were talking about last night in the meeting that we were doing was that sometimes a plant becomes a story and, and there's yes. a reason why you fell in love with it. And even though it may not be the best garden plant or attract the most pollinators, you, you love the plant. It's hard to break that tie with someone because of them. It's an emotional tie that it's, mm -hmm. you know, you, you know, there's, there's reasons why things are better than others, but it's hard to tell someone they're wrong for liking a plant that they like, right. <laughs> yes. you right. know, and, and that's, yep. that's, that's the hard thing, but it's nice when you have the science to back it up to say, if you like this one, it may not be the best plant. These are some other options, but if you, yeah. you know, it's, so how, 
what what decision goes behind choosing what you trial? I would imagine. Do, do you have already in the pipeline what your next five trials are going to be? Is it is it that far like planned yes. that far out? Okay. <laughs> yes, right. we actually um, we have the next thirty years or so planned out. Wow, wow. wow. which is pretty wild. Um, I will say, I mean. Really, the next five are pretty set in stone. Beyond that, it's um, there's, it's definitely subject to change, but it's nice to have that framework to try to plan through. Mm -hmm. um, and the trial garden is so conducive to planning because everything's in a certain amount of space for a certain amount of time. Um, and you can really look ahead, say in the next three years, this is what I want to have in there. But you also have to take a few steps back from that initial, when you plant that trial, there's already been a couple of years of work that's been put into that. Mm -hmm. from our plant records department, from our greenhouse department, um, particularly if we want to be out there collecting seed or growing on plants from seed in our greenhouses and including those plants in the trials. Um, that takes a couple of years of preparation. Huh. Um, so before a plant, a trial even gets in the trial, it's probably been our, in our radar for two, three years. Mm -hmm. And then trials run for three, four years. So right there, there's seven years invested um, in a single genera um, and then we we generate that research report. Um, so it's it's a quite a long um, process. And and from my standpoint, being here for two and a half years, I haven't actually started a trial that I've actually planned. Um, it's a lot of it has been carrying out plans that were already there, but it's just the nature mm -hmm. of it. Um, and it's 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 a very long process, and there's a lot going on behind the scenes. Yeah, and I, I always wondered yeah. how long these these trials lasted because. Yeah. I don't want to say it would be easy, but if it would be easier to just, you go out and get a couple different uh, varieties of echinacea, you go plant them. And then that first year, you kind of keep notes for a month or two, sure. but you don't know what well, the next year things could be wildly different. One plant could be way, way bigger. The other one could kind of start to taper off. So yep. it's nice to hear that you're doing it for like four years in the ground. And then you have all yes. that pre-planning goes and, into it as well. And that makes sense to me too, because say you have, you know, with my experience, say Coreopsis lime rock ruby, the first year you have an extremely mild winter and <clears throat> and it makes it through the winter just fine. Mm -hmm. But then the next year you have a tremendously cold, brutal yeah. winter and it, it doesn't make yeah. it. So I guess you have to give it the opportunity to withstand drought, heavy rain, yeah. winter. You're not going to get all, you may get it in one year, you may not. So right. it makes it makes sense that it may change over, mm -hmm. over time. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's really interesting too. And sometimes I wish the trials are even longer because sometimes I think three years may not be the threshold of determining whether a plant's truly long lived in a garden setting or it might actually be a shorter lived plant. Um, but traditionally our herbaceous trials have been three years. Um, our Baptisia trial was another year. You know, they take a little bit of time to get going. And to really that fourth year is when they really showed their, you know, their advertised mature traits. Um, and we just started breaking into woody plants as well. And I think the baseline for that's going to be five years. And we may plant them on um, that first year, let them get settled even for two years before we actually start collecting data. And even in the herbaceous trials, that first year when those plants are in the ground, things can be a little shaky. The data can be a little bit unusual at times. The bloom periods might be um, inconsistent. The second and third year of data is when we start seeing really consistent results. If that plant is, you know, sticking around and persisting, um, those two years often look very similar to each other. How, how many trials do you do simultaneously? Is it more than one or is it just literally one and then you move on to the next? So it's generally four at a time. Okay. Um, currently we have hydrangea arborescence, which is going to be ending its well, we're almost done collecting data on it. We're actually writing the research report on it that will come out um, this December, early January. Um, we are also evaluating Carex, um, which I'm really excited about. Carex is such a great genus, tons of versatility, um, not just for home gardeners, um, but we're looking at them as in a comparison of shade and sun. We have a full sun trial and a, in a shade section of the trial garden. So we can make those comparisons or trial things like cupra or ferns um, in those settings. Um, then our full sun setting is, is much larger. There's generally three different trials going on. And in addition to the hydrangea and the full sun, we have uh, Vernonia and we also have Solidago. I'm really interested in the Carex trials. Yeah. That one. Yeah. And might... I got to see, I guess it was two years ago and it was just really, yep. really neat to see the one that many different species and, and varieties of Carex there. 
Um, yeah. Just all right now. And you could really see the differences where you're not going to see that anywhere else. You're not going to see that in a wild setting or even a conventional right. landscape because who's planting them right next to each other like that? It was, it was very, very neat. Now, uh, if can could that program grow if if you wanted to i know you're doing four simultaneously say you wanted to do 10 like are you limited by space are you limited by funds what's where where did that four at a time factor in sure it's it's pretty much the space that we're working with currently um and i think that there's um, we're actually building a new greenhouse complex so the ground's gonna we're gonna break ground on that in the next month or so um and we're gonna have a little bit more um space that'll be behind the scenes for um either holding plants for future trials or doing smaller, more in, informal trials or potentially even trialing more woody plants at a time. Um, it's mostly a space thing. Um, and it's that those four trials running simultaneously is really, um, a lot of our time is consumed by that, particularly during the season where we're collecting data, which is generally about like early May through September. Although with the Brunoni and the Solidago, we're probably gonna go to, to frost with at least with the gold. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's going to extend that a little bit. Um, but four is, is somewhat manageable. There's some times where I feel like we're like we're running around like crazy people. Um, so I think I think um, it's mostly a space thing though. Um, and we are we're able to accomplish a lot in the trial garden. Um, it's myself and um, our part time my part time assistant Laura, who's fabulous. Um, it's really the two of us full time people, and then we have six um, horticultural volunteers, and then all of the pollinator watch volunteers volunteer team, which is about a dozen people as well. So we rely heavily on volunteers. And I think um, it could be something that a volunteer team could take up if we were to do, um, if we were to get extra space to work. I'm, I'm glad you yeah. touched on how many people because that was going to be my next question. Yeah. That's a lot. And can That's you explain what the, the pollinator watch um, volunteers are, are doing? Uh, other than Absolutely. like literally just sitting there and watching watch <laughs> yes. for hours. Um, oh, and I just want to clarify when I said that's a lot, I meant that's a lot of work for the amount of people you have. That's <laughs> yes, not, that's a lot of people. Sorry. Yes, no, it is. It is a lot, and there are times where it's, it can feel a little overwhelming. But like I said, the trial garden is so schedule oriented, and that even comes down to our weekly our weekly schedule. We know we have to collect horticultural data on those four trials. Um, we know we have to schedule a certain amount of pollinator watch team visits when those trials are in bloom. It's it's very easy to plan out. Um, so if you know planning ahead is is not a, a challenging thing. It's just kind of sticking ahead, uh, staying ahead, and not getting behind the eight ball. Um, but yeah, to Tom, to your question about the pollinator watch team. So the, the pollinator watch team uh, they're essentially a team of uh, volunteer citizen scientists. Um, some of them have have other volunteer roles at Mount Cuba Center, um, or um, they might be docents. Um, but essentially what they do is they come out to our trials when they're in bloom. So for, for um, trials that we want to count pollinators on, such as our hydrangea trial or a Solidago trial or our Vernonia trial, we have all those plants identified um, and they actually go out and we built an app for them to collect all this data. But what they're doing is they're looking at one plant or uh, one inflorescence in the case of the hydrangeas. If you were to look at a whole plant and try to count the pollinators, it would be impossible, like hundreds, if not thousands of different insects. Um, so we're in the hydrangeas, we're looking at one inflorescence and they're basically counting how many pollinator visits that inflorescence gets in 60 seconds. Um, so that, and that's basically a tally. Um, and then they'll go on to the next plant um, and do the same kind of count. Um, we've included, in the past, we've looked at specific targeted groups of pollinators, like with flocks, we were looking at specifically butterflies. Um, with Monarda, we were looking at hummingbirds as a category, and then butterflies and moths together as another category, trying to figure out which plants were preferred by which group, um, or most visited by, by each group. Um, but with the hydrangeas, it's just everything, all of the above, um, a lot of bees, a lot of beetles, um, a lot of wasps, it's been fascinating. Um, and then the Solidago and the Vernonia, it's been the same thing. Um, we might have to adjust the way we, we collect data on some of these plants that are absolutely massive. Um, we have one Vernonia that's 12, actually 13 and a half feet tall now. Wow. So wow. someone being able to, to see, uh, first of all, be able to see those pollinators and count them is challenging, um, especially with these really diverse trials. And not just diverse in size, but diverse in bloom times. We had Solidagos that were blooming in May. We've had them blooming pretty much nonstop um, all summer. And now we're really starting to get into the meat of things um, now. Um, we're going to have a lot more blooming now. But it's a lot of time that they spend out there. Um, they do fabulous work. 
Um, and I think it's this piece of our, our research is going to become more and more prominent and not just the counting. Um, I think the counting is really important, but I think there's other things we can do, be doing like um, identifying exactly which insects are going to these different plants and all those kinds of great things. But I think that's, this is the ecological side of things and the pollinator counts. I think you're going to see this become a much more central part of our research in the trial gardens. It's, yeah. Is it hard? I would imagine that you're trying to do this in a bubble so that everything has the same conditions. Is there out, outside influence that's that's hard to control um, or or some of the challenges trying to do this? Like, are you getting deer or are you, it's, I haven't seen the trial card, so I don't know. It could be in deer enclosure. I don't know. But I didn't know if if you have some challenges in in keeping things even for everything. Sometimes, um, I think the biggest challenge is that we are, pretty much everything is treated exactly the same. And it's, it's that same treatment may not be the treatment that specific species or a specific cultivars of species might want. Um, like I said, there's some plants like Echinacea pallida. It's probably one of my favorite plants in the Echinacea trial, but it just, it crashed every year. It flopped, it flopped over because the soil was too rich. It was too much moisture. Um, so that was challenging. And, and the piece of me that wants to tell people, you know, this is a great plant, particularly if you have really well-drained soil, um, uh, you know, an area of high competition, try it out. It's probably going to do so much better than how we did it, but I don't have the data to back that up. That's sometimes challenging. Um, the other piece that your question to herbivory um, with, with um, deer, we are fortunate to have the core gardens um, enclosed in a deer fence, a deer exposure. Um, that being said, there are, there's always a small number of deer in there but we rarely have any issues in the trial garden. And in addition to the deer fence, we have a smaller, um, I'll call it a, a rabbit fence or a groundhog fence, mm -hmm. concrete footer, so that um, smaller mammals have a difficult time getting in as well. Sometimes they do. Um, there's a few rabbits that have figured it out um, this year in particular, but it's really interesting how selective they're being um, on some of our Solidago and some of our Vernonia. It's not the whole trial. There's certain species they really seem to prefer. Um, which has been fascinating. And that's one of the pieces that I think is actually more of a challenge for me is not having that herbivory data. Um, it's a question I get asked a lot. Uh, it's a big problem for gardens in this area, deer pressure in particular, where deer pressure is higher than it, you know, than, you know healthy um, levels of populations probably should be. Um, I know in, even in my home garden, I get a lot of deer pressure. Um, but uh, thankfully we're, we're working with um, the University of, of um, uh, temple, the Temple U and their Arboretum, and they're growing us um, almost a full set of our Solidago uh, trial as well in an unprotected area, and they're seeing that same selective herbivory. So we're hope, we're going to try to answer those questions for the first time with the Solidago trial. Awesome, that's yeah, great. That's that's very forward thinking. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say stuff. that would be you know if a rabbit yeah. got in was only eating two of ten, that's important to know. You mm, know, absolutely. If, you know, it's and it depends on what you want. If you if you want a garden where you don't want things eaten, or you want a garden where you do want things eaten, you know. Sure. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And that's all we're we're trying to, to inform people and and I'll get get information so that people can make informed decisions based on different goals. Now, with with Carex, one of the things I was thinking because that is so diverse. Sure. You know, you have Carex stricta that can be inundated up to six inches to yep. Carex conservanica, which you know, likes dry and sandy. Are, are those conditions taken into consideration for the select? Are you only maybe leaving some of those out if they are wetlands so that everything has a consistent, you know, soil base that, that they can survive in? Sure. Oftentimes we'll try to include them just to see how they do in average garden conditions. And what we, we do consider our trial garden to be somewhat average garden conditions um, okay. for gardens in the mid-Atlantic. Um, and it's been fascinating. Some of these plants that you wouldn't I wouldn't have thought would do well outside of a, a true wetland area are doing really, really well in average conditions. Some of them are doing really, really well in full sun and they haven't been watered ever. Um, it's really interesting. The plants that really want it probably more well-drained um, are often the ones that are struggling in the trial. Um, like um, Carex silicia, um, we have that, which is a, a dune plant. Um, a coastal dune plant. And um, we have that in our shade area as well as the full sun. It's doing much better in the sun conditions, but in the shade, it's a really weak, small plant, um, which makes sense. This wants to grow in a really sandy, really well-drained area, low nutrients. Um, 
but it's just fascinating to see what these plants are capable of doing in average garden conditions. Um, that being said, we will talk about where this plant wants to grow and where what implications that might have for someone who does want to grow um, a Carex in a drier, sandier condition. That might be the plant you want to pick. Um, I do think with the Carex trial in particular, it's going to look a little different than a lot of our past trials. There's going to be a lot of those considerations brought in. It's going to be more of what these plants are, how we think you could use them. Um, and of course, there are top performers, but I think we're going to have a much different view about um, the, the, whole, the trial as a, as a whole. And I think that's, I think that's important, not, you know, to, not for which items will fail when they're not in the conditions they're typically mm -hmm. in, but which items thrive when they're not in the conditions that they're typically in. Right. So you know that versatility, like Tom and I did a site visit just a couple of weeks ago, we were at a golf course, and it was probably you know, they were having trouble getting things established on the ends of their ponds, which were retention, okay. but sure. there, there's a fluctuation depending on the time of year, year of up to five feet in wow. pond depth. So how do you plant the edges of these ponds knowing that they could be dry this year and under two feet of water next mm -hmm. year? And it's a, right. it's a situation where we've been struggling for two or three years to find out what those answers are. But if you can find out that, hey, you know, this will live in a foot of water, but we've had it survive in just saturated conditions for, for three years and it survived well, that's really invaluable mm -hmm. knowledge that we don't always have. So it's, sure. I mean, that's, and, and I don't know of anyone else doing that kind of research. Yeah, and it's fascinating too. I mean, there's plants that are doing remarkably well in the trials just from an objective standpoint. Um, and a couple of species like Carex amorei and Carex trichocarpa, beautiful plants, um, really like gorgeous foliage, upright, tolerant of full sun. Actually, both of them are doing better in full sun conditions than they are doing in shade, um, but they're extremely aggressive. Um, and I mean, very rhizomatous. Um, and it's one of those things where you may not want to plant it in your home garden, particularly if you have less space, but if you're trying to stabilize like a drainage ditch or if you have a rain garden that you're going to mow all the way around, these are perfect, perfect plants. Um, so yeah, it's, it's one of those, again, we want to try to think about this from different design considerations, um, different goals that you may have um, when you're gardening with Carex or when you're restoring with Carex. Um, a lot of these, these species fit really interesting niches. Um, but you know, with those, in the case of those two, maybe just not for a suburban small bed and a um, suburban home garden and a small bed type of thing. No, but if your goal is to plant a, a native plant that is more aggressive to help combat invasives, exactly, and maybe mm -hmm. this is the perfect plant for you. There's always a, a, exactly. a purpose or reason for everything, and yep, you know, and I, I'd be remiss if we didn't touch on this, and we kind of talked about it before we we started the podcast. You know, there's always a debate on straight species versus cultivars. And, sure. and depending on what you're trying to accomplish, I, I can understand the argument for both. But this yep. research I feel is so important because it's one thing to make an argument based on emotion. Sure. And we were talking about that emotional tie. If someone has that love or that story, it's hard to tell them that they're wrong, but right. um, it's hard to beat the science. And, and if you're just guessing that no cultivar is going to be on the same ecological merit as a straight species, this, this could definitely prove that theory wrong. And I'm sure it has on, on certain instances. Yeah, and it's, it's one of those topics that we get asked a lot um, and there's just not a ton of work being done on it. I'd love to see more um, places like Mount Cuba Center um, around the country trying to answer this question as well. Um, essentially what we've found, um, and this is just um, big picture and uh, really just from what information that we found from pollinator visitation um, is that plants that have minimal human influence, I'm talking about um, cultivars that may have just been a selection of a species, somebody like Phlox paniculata gina, that was just a plant that was found in the wild in Tennessee and put into cultivation, obviously clonally, um, but it's it, other than that selection, it's had very little human influence. Um, in, its, in its introduction and in its um, journey to the world of horticulture. That plant is, was absolutely the best plant um, to attract, for attracting butterflies in our entire trial, which was fascinating. And we did actually take that deeper dive and we wanted to see if it had to do with nectar volume or sugar content. And it was extremely comparable to straight species 
um, Flox paniculata and regular Flox, um, other comparable Flox paniculata cultivars in the trial garden. But often, once we, when we start seeing a lot of human manipulation, a lot of breeding, particularly when, we're, when you're changing some floral structure in some fundamental way, that's when we see a drop in visitation. Um, a really good example of that was in our um, echinacea trial. When we think about like those double or pom-pom type um, echinaceas. Mm -hmm. A lot of those um, mutations that cause double flowers to occur are what we'll call double flowers. Um, a lot of those are replacing some kind of some organ in that flower that oftentimes has um, pollinator benefit. And we're seeing from the visitation, pollinators aren't spending time on those plants. They're going to the plants, um, oftentimes the species or the selections of the species or minimally um, influenced cultivars. And that's where they're spending the bulk of their time. And we're seeing the same thing with our hydrangea trial. We're doing the same pollinator counts with them. It's been fascinating. We're, when we talk about um, lace cap um, types of hydrangeas, compared to you know, the big mop heads, those big, um, those big flowery inflorescences that you see in arrangements. Um, there's not a lot of fertile flowers in there. And the theory behind that, I mean, before we even start, we, we kind of think about this and say, oh, we're probably gonna see less pollinators there. And that's exactly what happens. Um, one of our hydrangeas in particular, um, Hayes Starburst, it has oftentimes these mop heads have some kind of fertile flower presence in them. There, there's a little bit there, some more than others, but Hayes Starburst, we haven't found a single fertile flower in any of those inflorescences. And over two years of data collection, 2018 and 2019, it had five pollinators counted on it over the entire season, which is like nothing. Wow. Looking at the lace caps and that number's in the 200s, um, 230, 250. It's very, very telling that insects seem to be going to plants that have that benefit. Um, and, um, and again, it's oftentimes the cultivars are, that have minimal human influence that we're seeing um, higher numbers of insects on. And, and, and part of why this is important, and, and like I was saying, there's, there's different reasons for, for everyone, and there's space for everyone in the spectrum to Absolutely. be good. Mm -hmm. Now, the flocks that you mentioned may not be the best choice as far as doing a large scale restoration. Exactly. Yep. But if that's the gateway plant for someone, you know, where they're like, hey, I tried phlox, but I keep getting powdery mildew. I'm not having any success. And this cultivar is going to bring them into the native plant spectrum, get them started and attract butterflies and actually help insects. That's a huge, that's, mm -hmm. that's great knowledge to everyone has to start somewhere. And that's what we're exactly. saying. So as long yep. as you can make that space without that knowledge, maybe someone gives up on, on flocks and they never touch that again. Yeah. Um, and, and that's part of the, our trials is we want, we want gardeners to be successful and we want people to plant that native plant and say, wow, this really worked. Let's plant another one. Um, or, you know, maybe I should look back at other pre at, trial reports and pick out a few more plants and hopefully those plants will work as well and they'll get inspired. Um, exactly what you said, I would not recommend cultivars for a restoration site. Um, I think oftentimes you're, you're looking, you want that genetic diversity mm -hmm. when you are going back to plant a place like that, which is why I admire so much what you guys do. Um, Thank you. Questions about where, I, where can I get locally sourced things? Where can I get species plants? And often there's not a great answer. There's not a lot of places around here, but Pinelands is one of the best places in this region, I think, to do that. It's so wonderful, like from a personal level, um, having Pinelands uh, direct um, just to buy plants from my home garden is fabulous. Um, but I think there is an entire, like you were saying, an entire end of the spectrum in the native plant community um, that may be more attractive to cultivars and maybe they only have a certain amount of space in their home garden. And, Maybe they can only plant one phlox. Maybe they can have a field of, you know, a hundred genetically different phlox paniculata. And if I was only going to plant one phlox and I wanted butterflies in my home garden, I would pick I would pick phlox, phlox paniculata gina. Um, and I just I, like you said, I think there's there's ways for the entire spectrum to do good and to plant native plants and to get excited about native plants. And I don't think cultivars um, should be absent from that conversation, but they're certainly not a solve they're not the, the fix all for every situation either. No, but say, say you have an apartment and you have a, um, a patio and you have some containerized plants and you want specific native plants, but you know, it's not the right conditions for sure. those. And, and you're not going to get that, but you can have a cultivar where you're still, you're still bringing in pollinators. You're still bringing in beneficial insects. You're still doing good. And you're still able to have nature as part of where you live. I, I don't see how that could be a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't see the negative in that. Right. But 
Tom, I feel like I keep cutting you off. <laughs> no, you have uh, so <laughs> many great questions here. Um, I guess changing it up a little bit is uh, is throughout the history of the trial gardens, what are some of the really important findings that you guys have made? Um, I know I've, there's been some some presentations I've seen where I'm like, oh, that's a really, really cool statistic or a number of pollinator visits that you found. What are some of the ones that really stick out to you? For me, the, 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 the findings that get me really excited are those, those statistics that you're talking about, those, poll, those plants that are really preferred by pollinators. Um, and, you know, for me in my home garden, um, I don't have a ton of space. And um, oftentimes if I'm looking for a phlox or if I'm looking for like a Monardo or a phlox, I'll look back at our previous trial reports and, and use those to inform some of my decisions at home. Mm-hmm. But like for Monarda didima, Jacob Klein, like that, that plant attracted 10 times as many hummingbirds as any other Monarda didima in the trial, in the trial garden. It was, it was unbelievable. And now, that's going to have to be another one we add to our list. Yeah. And, then, yeah. and, and, and this is another yeah. one, Sam, where you're probably right. This is just a recurring theme where we've, <laughs> not to get too far off track, sure. we have a, a debate all the time on how to pronounce certain plants. And I've never <laughs> sure. heard it pronounced Didima, but I've now I I think you're probably right. And I'm definitely wrong yeah. when I say Didima. Well, no, I, you know, truly, I don't think anyone can knock you for, for Latin name. I think if you say all the letters, you're good. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's my standpoint. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, like Menarda, the regular Menarda Didima is great, but Jacob Klein just attracted tons more hummingbirds. Yeah. It was something like 273 visits compared to like 20 was the next close. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just incredible. And, you know, if I could plant, it wasn't the top performer from a horticultural standpoint. It got a little bit more powdery mildew, so it didn't quite make that cut. But for me, in my home garden, I don't, it doesn't bother me. Um, I don't really mind if there's a little powdery mildew on it. I can tolerate that. Um, if I'm going to get more butter or more hummingbirds. You know, that's awesome. Um, and then, you know, it's like the flocks was incredible seeing, like, why was that so different? Um, why was that? Why was that so preferred by by butterflies? I mean, really, what we think it was is that there's in those inflorescences that are one of in those um, in those flower heads. There's just more flowers and they're smaller, um, so there's more flowers per square whatever. And the butterflies can be more efficient when they're feeding. Um, they can get you know two, three, four <laughs> times as many flowers without moving um, as they would on a regular Phlox paniculata um, flower head. Um, it's, it's a lot of those things that are really interesting take homes um, for me. And really that, that pollinator component has been really important, again, just in my um, informing decisions in my home garden. And it's the part that I get probably the most excited about out in the trial garden as well. Um, watching these plants and you can see it when we're out in the, when those hydrangeas were in bloom, we have all the lace caps really down on one end of this huge row of hydrangeas. And it's loud down there. There's there was bees and insects. I mean, it's just like this experience when you walk through there, and it's inspiring. Um, when you walk down the other end, and it's almost all mop heads, it's quiet. There's no insect activity. Um, and to me, those are like that's the, that that's what gets me excited. Um, and that's those are the pieces and the stories that I really get excited about telling in these research reports as well. Awesome. I I was gonna say what. Going back to the the Menarda Jacob Klein, what sure. was it about that plant that made hummingbirds prefer it, um, or is there an obvious reason, or or no? So they they tended to prefer um, longer floral tubes and the color red. Um, really, the Menarda didimas and a lot of the red cultivars uh, attracted more hummingbirds than anything else. Uh, but Menarda didima Jacob Klein, I believe, was a little bit taller than all the other reds. So I think that extra height with that long floral tube um, really just put it over the edge for them. Hmm. Um, but yeah, yeah, no, that's I, interesting. Cause that was one that always stuck out to me when I'm like, that it just blew everything else out of the water when it came to hummingbirds. Yeah. There's nothing close. I'm like, okay, yeah. well, there's something going on there. That's, yeah. that's right. interesting. I, right. And I would love to someday take a deeper dive and yeah. you know, do a, do an analysis of the nectar, um, and see the different sugar concentrations and see if there's a, you know, greater sugar volume or that flower can recharge its nectar faster. Um, these are all questions we would love to be asking and hopefully someday we'll get there. Um, but again, we're still early on. We're still learning how to be efficient, how to get information that's, um, that's valuable and relevant out there um, when we can. Across, our, across the board throughout the trials, are there other cultivars that you feel deserve some merit that like like Jacob Klein or like Gina, that something that if, if you're going to go the cultivar route, that these are some of the better ones to, to look at? 
Sure. I mean, there's definitely some great plants from all of our trials. And I think um, sometimes cultivars uh, can make a plant um, more accessible or more readily used by, um, by maybe a, a home gardener. Um, and, and a perfect example of that, I'm talking about uh, Coreopsis tripterus. I love that straight species. I actually love, there's a cultivar out there called Flower Tower, which nobody sells anymore, but it's huge. It's, a, it's like a tetrapoid version of Coreopsis tripterus. Like it's just an absolute monster of a plant. And it's, it's fantastic. Um, but um, a lot of people kind of get turned off by the extra height. Um, and it's sometimes hard for nurseries to really promote like large, big plants. Um, I personally love them. I don't have any problem with that, but, but I do understand that challenge. Um, something like, um, and of course, this is, is going to sound perfect, me promoting a plant of, of one of our introductions. But when you think about like gold standard Coreopsis tripus, um, it just puts that species in a slightly smaller um, habit. It gets to between, like five, six feet tall. It's really sturdy, doesn't flop over. Um, it's just, it just makes that species a little bit more accessible, um, I think for an average home gardener. Um, and that being said, that was just a seed selection um, from seed we collected in Alabama and we grew out a bunch of seedlings and that one was just more compact, they're sturdier stems. Um, so really not a lot of, so uh, not a lot of influence other than just the selection on our part. Uh, and what's, you know, the important thing that I see about that, Tom was just mentioning last night that some of the larger plants can be challenging because you want everyone to be successful. But if you put some of these larger plants in the wrong conditions, you get a lot of flop. Like we were yeah. uh, commenting, we have Rudbeckia liciniata yep. uh, oh, alongside yeah. our office. That's, I don't remember talking about this at all. Frank. Yeah, <laughs> come on. So, and and it, it was starting to flop. Yeah. And maybe if, if, this was your first interaction with it and that's what you saw you would you could easily say i don't want that but if you know that there's cultivars that stay strong that they don't flop can take multiple conditions and that person can be successful that's the most important thing you you need everyone to be successful or have yeah. some some sense of success otherwise why keep doing it yeah and that's the hope and in the way we grow them in the trial garden um it's very uh similar to um how a lot of people approach gardening. Um, plants are, you know, surrounded with mulch. They're often spaced a little bit, um, which isn't how I garden at home. A lot of times, the plants that in my home garden behave differently because they're in they're in much higher competition and they're less apt to flop and things like that. But if they are grown kind of individually, um, it's nice to know which plants do stand up. And um, you know, sometimes people can get turned off by plants like Rebecca Lynn sitting on it. I think it's a, it's a fantastic species. Everyone should grow it. Um, but sometimes people get turned off because of that floppy habit. Yeah. Um, but that being said, we do try to offer people um, different cultural suggestions. We do cutbacks in like May. A lot of times we'll do that with our Solidago and Vernonia trial and just say, look, this plant can get this big, but if you did a controlled cutback at and say the end of May, um, you'll get a plant that might be more manageable in a smaller landscape if you like that. You know, if, if a lot of these things about this plant appeal to you, but maybe you can't grow a 10 foot tall Vernonia where you where your garden is, mm -hmm. um, you know, here's an option. So there's there's a lot of other variables that go along with that. I mean, the flowering is often delayed a little bit, but but that's a good thing too. You know, yeah. you, you're, yeah. you're giving pollinators some late source. I actually the Rudbeckia liciniata in my property, I give it a May cut back just yep. to keep it a little more controlled. I don't have it in the, the best condition, so I do get that flap if I don't. But then you get a little bit more late season push. You know, we've talked about that with Asclepius kind of yeah. come back early, just so you get blooms throughout the whole year to help pollinators. So sure. I know that's sure. a little bit more of an unnatural <laughs> setting, but sometimes in nature sure. that happens anyway, so. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, you see uh, fields that get mowed with that are full of Vernonia, and right when they're about to bloom, and three, four weeks later, they're back blooming and they're only like three feet tall. It's kind of fascinating. I mean, to see what, what you can get away with in a garden setting um, is also interesting in these trials as well. Mm -hmm. What What is, now that you've been doing this, what is your favorite part of your job? What What is the, the one thing that gets you pumped up and excited to come to work to do? I think in the whole process, it's, it's a ton of fun and, um, you know, being able to learn and be a part of these trials from the planning to the implementation to the data collection. I mean, like Tom was saying with the, you know, with the Carex, I only knew a handful of Carex when I started, but when you see them all together, it's fascinating how different they are. And just learning these genera, you almost, 
you know, I won't, I won't use the word expert because there are people who know so much more about carrots than I will ever know. Um, but you really, like, you become familiar with these genera and you really, um, you develop this wealth of knowledge over the three or four years of, of your trial. And then to share that knowledge with people, um, whether that's through the research report or, you know, giving talks or coming on your podcast, that's, the whole process is exciting. Um, it's so diverse and there's different times of year you're doing different things and you change gears all the time. And it's just a really dynamic job and it's a lot of fun. I think what I love about your job <laughs> And that it's it's something that you don't typically get as a gardener mm -hmm. at all is you yeah. get closure. You get to start <laughs> something and you get to finish something. And that's yeah. not necessarily what gardening en encompasses sometimes. Like you could feel, you know, we have listeners that are working on removing their they're uh, working to preserve natural lands and sure. they, they feel that they can't get ahead of the invasive that it's not right. they're not making a dent and they're impatient. And we right. always preach patience and and sometimes you feel like you're doing a lot of work and you're not getting the reward and over mm -hmm. time you you do see it right. but sometimes it never ends you actually right. get a little bit of closure the, the trial and not saying <laughs> that it ever really yeah. ends but you get right. to end the trial and publish your results and and get to hear the feedback and and know that it's going to make a difference in people's lives when they look at this yeah yeah, no, I, that's a great point. Um, I never actually thought about it that way because, you know, traditional gardening, you're never done. No, no, you're <laughs> never done. done but you wrong. Um, <laughs> with, with my OCD, I, I would love that closure. <laughs> that's right. No, but I mean, there is some, it, you're right, there is a little bit of closure at the end and, you know, coming to these conclusions and, and reflecting on what you've learned um, in a, you know, in a really laid out way is, is, is really fun. Um, and yeah. Reflecting on what you've done for those three years and how those plants have behaved and performed, it's, been, it's fascinating. Is there, after all the, the hard work that goes into it and you get that closure, is there ever any negative feedback? Like, I know there's there's always yeah. trolls and haters. <laughs> like, I would imagine that that has to exist in, in this spectrum as well. Yeah, Sam, I was actually even going to br bring this up a little bit because uh, right at, shortly after the Echinacea trial was released, that was this past winter, correct? Yes. And... Um, and we, I saw it and we had an informal chat and yes. we were actually talking about some of the negative feedback, but, uh, yeah, but even, yeah it, it was, it's interesting seeing just so even some of the positive feedback and how there's some folks that just take this, that would, it came out, Mount Cuba said it, this is the, the gospel. If you don't do it this way, if you don't choose these plants, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. And then you have um, other people who are the exact opposite. Yes. It, it's interesting. Of course you get feedback, the whole spectrum, of course. I mean, it's, there is some negatives out there, um, some negative feedback that we get, and a lot of that is often centered around the cultivar question. Um, and um, and I totally understand that. And um, you know, a lot of the feedback that we get is that we're not doing enough to um, to answer that question. We're not really, you know, we're doing the pollinator counts, but are we identifying the insects? Are we, you know, measuring um, the protein content of of pollen? Are we measuring the sugar volumes and the sugar concentrations in um, a lot of these flowers? You know, a lot of times the answer is no. Um, we have done that, um, and it's something that we are looking forward to expanding on. But we're learning, and we're we're trying to get better all the time. And even in the future, we're going to be tailoring our our trials to really continue to ask the cultivar question um, because this is becoming such a hot button conversation and topic. Um, and uh, you know, continue. We're just going to continue to do the work. We're going to continue to try to make our data more relevant. Um, and that being said, you know, because we say something doesn't mean that this is the only way to do things. Um, and, you know, what we're, what we advertise is our results are likely going to be very relevant to you if you live in the mid-Atlantic region. Um, and that being said, we, a lot of our top performing um, echinaceas were cultivars from, from a horticultural standpoint. Mm -hmm. But we included a species section in there because I wanted to tell that story about why I think the species are important, why they likely didn't do well in our trial conditions, but if you had X, Y, and Z in your home garden, you should try them. Um, I think that that's, um, I think what the research report should be looked at as is a resource for people to be able to make informed decisions. Mm -hmm. If my goal at home is to plant a garden that attracts pollinators, I'll go straight to the pollinator section of this research report. 
Um, so like exactly like I said with Minarda de Dima, Jacob Klein, um, it didn't, wasn't the best horticulture performer, but it attracted more hummingbirds than anything else. Like that's the plant I want. Um, and their species like are second best um, echinacea as far as attracting uh, uh, pollinator insects was the straight species echinacea purpurea. And a lot of the top plants from a pollinator perspective could trace their lineage directly to echinacea purpurea and may have just been selections of that plant. I mean, that's very telling to me. Um, I think a lot of the times insects are going to where they're getting the benefit from. Um, and of course, there's more we can be doing to reinforce that theme. Um, but I think really using our, res our reports um, as a tool to help make informed decisions, whatever your goal mm -hmm. is, um, should be the way they're looked at. It shouldn't be like, this is what you should do no matter what by, you know, that plant did terribly in our trial, in their trial, don't bother with it. You know, try it at your home. Do your own little trial. Um, it's you know we are not um, excluding plants. We have that's one of the reasons that we have write ups on every single plant we've ever trialed on the website. You know, on our research reports, we only generally feature like the top ten or whatever. Um, and same thing with the pollinators, um, pollinator preferred plants. We might only feature the top fifteen, but there's information on every single plant that we've trialed. Um, believe me, I know that we write up uh, every single one of them at the end of the trials, which <laughs> is longer than writing the, the research reports, but it's there. And again, it's just, we want this to be a resource for people to use, again, to make just informed decisions, um, whatever their goal is for their garden. Yeah. And that's a great point is saying what the goal is for your garden. And uh, I'll bring up another little story is, and this was actually, um, uh, I went to a presentation by your predecessor, George Coombs. Yeah. Uh, about the what was going on in the trial gardens and I sat next to uh, I'm going to not name names but it was sure. a well-known nurseryman in in New Jersey and uh and we walked out and uh this was really right when a lot of these um the big native plant cultivar debate kind of started sure. like 2014 yep. or something like that Annie White's research from UVM had just kind yep. of come out yep. and um and then the Mount Cuba stuff was was getting a little bit more prominent and uh, we walked out of the presentation and uh, the guy who was sitting next to was like, oh, yeah, what'd you think? And I was like, oh, it was, it was really interesting. He's like, yeah, I don't feel so bad about growing cultivars now. <laughs> <laughs> really great cultivars out there. Where my takeaway was when you looked at everything, it seemed like the, the straight species was, was really high, but it really came down to goals. Like his right. goals was he wanted to have really top performing plants in a, a home garden setting, where sure. ours was we want something that's going to perform ecologically and go to right. a, a restoration setting. So yeah, I'm glad you brought up that whole, it depends on what your goal is, is how it, and, and it I'm, comes down I'm, to. I'm glad you both mentioned that, you know, one of our listeners, Skip Burns, uh, had said at one point, I can't remember the the conversation, but he's like, the science is science. It's it's not opinionated, it's data, and it's factual. It, it is exactly what it is, but it depends on how someone looks at it and uses mm -hmm. that data for their own agenda sometimes. And until it changes. <laughs> until it changes, yeah. Until it, yeah, it is what it is until it's, it's no longer that. Yeah. You know, right. but it's, you know, someone could easily go through and just pick out the couple things that supports their agenda, you know, if that's what they really want to mm -hmm. do. So it's, yes. that's, and that's not any, that has no reflection on Mount Cuba or the research. It's just sometimes, yeah. people use it for bad reasons. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think a, a perfect example of that um, was the research that, that Doug Talamy did here um, mm -hmm. on, he was looking at, you know, herbivory comparisons between um, cultivar shrubs um, or cultivar woody plants compared to the straight species. And that was the whole thing. That was the, the study where it came out that um, it was shown that statistically fewer insects were feeding on plants that had, had darker foliage or had anthocyanin in the foliage. And a lot of times that's what people were seizing on and saying, oh, don't plant, you know, this means cultivars are bad. This, you know, the dark foliage means this, I'll plant them. Um, but the whole other side of it was plants that had different cultivars that were smaller, cultivars that had variegated foliage. There was really no statistical difference in the amount of feeding between that and the straight species. And to me, that was almost a win for cultivars. I was like, look, I mean, this is performing an ecological function, even though this is the plant that you know, it's not the straight species, but maybe it's available in your home garden center and you can feel comfortable that by planting this in my home landscape, I'm going to support some kind of wildlife and some kind of herbivory in my home. Um, but it's unfortunate that's kind of, that's rarely what's referenced um, when people talk about that study. Um, but yeah, it's, it's exactly what you were saying, Tom. It's, it's just interesting what 
what pieces are selected out um, for different agendas. You know, but that's that's another important uh, fact, Sam, is that you're giving people the options if they have 50 options, which one performed the best ecological function. So someone could blindly just go out and, and grab something that is per performing no ecological functions, at least if, if they have choices, say they can't find the straight species, they only have mm -hmm. these five things and they know this yeah. one is going to give them the most ecological function. That's yeah. a wonderful tool that we didn't have 20 years ago. Right. Right. And that's, I, I wish there were more of it. I, I really do. Yeah. One yeah. Oh, oh, you Sorry, go, go, ahead, go ahead, Tom. Uh, I was just going to say, I just, I, I don't think we shouldn't be alone in asking these questions and doing this research. I wish there was gardens all over the country that were doing similar studies, um, and particularly from uh, the pollinator and wildlife perspective. Um, but hopefully, we'll get there. <laughs> yeah, and that was, uh, I guess. Um, I don't want to say it was a complaint, but one of the things when when the echinacea study had come out that that I remarked on was, yeah, this works for like the mid-Atlantic. So if I was to take that data and use it at my garden in Jersey, it would probably line up pretty closely. Right. But if you were to take it and use it at a garden in California, it's, it's going to be completely different. Right. Uh, or not, I shouldn't say completely different, but it could have it, it could very be. different yeah, results. It could be. Yep. So, well, there's, I mean, there's, and we've talked about this before it, in a lot of these cultivars and introductions, there's a lot of money behind this is a big, big money making thing. And, oh, absolutely. and having yep. worked for star roses and, and seeing the, the rose trial gardens that went into like selecting knockout rose and, and sure. deep resistance and things like that. A lot of times things are being chosen because of their looks, but if, right. if, I'm I'm just waiting for that nursery to make that connection that if I can prove ecological function and pollinator habitat as a selection, I could corner the market. <laughs> Not just <laughs> yeah. that it's pretty or stands up straight or it, it it blooms more. If someone can nail down and have that try, I don't know that that ecological function or pollinator habitat is going into their choice on what they choose to introduce now. Right. I, I will say that um, I, I, I do hope that shifts, shifts and I think that it, it might be. I mean, it's mm -hmm. the thing that we get the most interest on um, when I go to talks. People want to hear about the pollinator side of things. Yeah. Maybe it's just the groups that are approaching me for the different talks, but but my general feeling is like people get almost more excited when, when you see them out in the trial garden and they can see that, that pollinator activity firsthand on something like hydrangea arborescens. Um, or like a, a selection of like hydrangea harborescence Haas halo. People get excited. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even more than they see than they do when they see you know a big beautiful like pink flowered um, inflorescence that may not have a lot of fertile flowers in it. And of course, there are people that have you know that um, nostalgic connection to hydrangeas, and people think that they're pretty just as is. But I I think that there is. Um, People are starting to think more about this question, and people are, are getting more interested in gardening for, you know, having their garden be more than just a beautiful place and to have it, you know, serve some kind of functionality in the landscape as well for wildlife. Yeah, it, it's definitely moving that way because, uh, well, even our good friends, Daryl and Carrie from Sunset Farmstead, their whole mission is to have... Uh, the best plants for pollinators and i know they're doing, doing a lot of your research um to affect what their uh their planting decisions are for what they're gonna offer for their customers so yeah. that's like that's right. the major point they, here's they're my million dollar marketing idea ready i'm giving away <laughs> free marketing ideas sure. so tom in the presentation that we gave last night tom was showing um something that whole foods had done uh where it was uh, a produce section and this is your selection with bees and then 90% of it was removed and this is your selection with no bees. When you go into a garden center, you do see plants and sometimes they're even labeled incorrectly as far as this is a native and it's not, na it's native to somewhere, but it's not native to where it's being sold. A native sure. plant. Right. So just a, as a, a good point, if you had stick tags, it just had big pictures of bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, wasps yeah. things and you put one of those in for each thing that it supports in that plant and you see some plants with none and some plants with 10 you know you know there's going to be those people to say i don't want insects i don't want that but mm -hmm. for the ones that are yeah. supporting ecological function and you can see right then and there wow look at all the things that this supports this is what yeah. i want that would yeah. be one heck of a tool if you want to sell something really quickly i think that's the way to do it 
Yeah. Now someone no, there, I, I just gave it away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to take that and run with it. <laughs> there um, you go. <laughs> like if, if, if you had that in the gardens with, with, oh, with yeah. something like that, just where they can see each thing that it supports, man, what, what a, a, a difference that makes. I, yeah. I think someone would walk away with, you know, you could teach kids, Hey, how many count, how many each one does, which one does the most. Right. You know, right. I think that would stick. There you Absolutely. go. Run with it. <laughs> so going on a little bit different path, as you mentioned, some of the, the uh, varieties that uh, Mount Cubit actually discovered on their own. What sure. happens after you kind of prove its garden worthiness? Uh, what's the next step to, to, I guess, bring it to the, the horticulture trade? Yeah, so, um, so we're not really in, in the business of, um, of growing mass quantities of plants, and, and we're not a nursery ourselves. So a lot of times um, forming partnerships is a really important piece of that. And North Creek Nurseries has been a huge partner for us in the past. They've helped us um, introduce a lot of plants, um, a lot of our introductions. And I will mention our introduction program has been going on since Dick Lighty was here. There's been introductions since the early or the late 80s. Um, I believe there's 19 or so plants that have been introduced over the years, but they've always been selections of species. Um, and they've always been, there's always been some kind of interesting twist on the species. Um, most recently, our Iris versicolor purple flame. It's a really interesting form of the species that just comes up with that like eggplant purple foliage in the spring. It's really striking. Um, and North Creek was, was um, are you know a partner uh, in getting that introduced? Um, they liked the plant. They got it into tissue culture with a lab, I think, on the west coast, um, and then oh, they're producing it and selling it. Um, so really, like um, us to identify nurseries that um, you know whether it's a plant that might be um, that might fit that um, template a little bit better, like plants that might be able to be um, easily produced quickly. Um, those might fit the more mass production. Um, uh, type of template where there are other plants, like we have a couple um, couple things in the pipeline that might be slower to produce, um, but we still think are really interesting plants. Um, so we may be working with more specialized partners who are growing things on a smaller scale um, or plants that are, are difficult to propagate um, at a large, you know, again, at a larger scale. Um, it's really finding the right partner for us to help get those plants out in the marketplace. But we are trying to promote what we think are, are great garden plants and we wanna get them in the hands of gardeners and people see those plants when they're here. Um, and uh, yeah, we want to we wanna make sure people can garden with them if they so choose. Iris first color is my favorite plant. And <laughs> I do like that introduction. I really do. It's a lot of fun. And, and again, there's nothing wrong with the straight species. It's a fabulous species. Um, but if you're interested, you know, if you want some of that extra spring color in your garden, plant it with a calca palustris, um, plant it with some wood poppy. Man, that purple and yellow is just like, Wow. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Did you have, did you have just uh, uh yeah, I had, I guess I had a couple more. Okay. All right. Sure. I knew you did. I knew you did. <laughs> um, one of them is, so I've gotten to walk through the trial gardens. Is that open to the public as well? I was along with all Mount Cupid. That's, oh man, that's gotta be a risk too. I'm like, I've been really into plant theft lately. <laughs> not, not, oh. I'm not stealing plants. <laughs> But I'm like, sure. just wow. like the whole you need, idea. You need to check Tom's just, pockets yeah, next just time. The, just the whole, <laughs> the whole idea of it, and that um, a lot of people walk through and say, "Oh yeah, that's that's pretty cool. I'm going to take some home. I'm going to grab some seed. I'm going to grab them yeah. and then propagate at home." But then they have something where you're actually doing some of these trials. I guess most of what you're trialing is already commercial avail commercially available. It's not like it's it's um, unreleased yet. But, right. Yeah, yeah. A lot of that is the case. Like it's, it's stuff that we could, you know, a lot of the plants and a lot of the trials, we've just gone out and bought what we could buy. Um, yeah. We supplemented that with maybe there are plants in our, in our collection already that we thought were really great. And we should include in the trial. Um, maybe our um, Bill McAvoy, the Delaware state botanist, um, yeah. you know, he sees something out um, uh, in the wildlands of Delaware and says, you know, I think this might make a great garden plant, maybe include it in your trials. Um, maybe we go out and collect seed and grow it on in our greenhouse and include it in our trials. Um, that being said, I don't, I don't know if there's anything like trade secret wise. And, and the whole part of our, the whole, like one of the central tenets to the trial garden is to be public facing and for people to be able to go in, even as the trial's going on and you can make decisions right there. I mean, there, our Carex trial, if you were to go through it right now, I think most people would be able to pick out the top 15 plants. I mean, they just, 
they're the things that look really good right now. And you know, I encourage that. I want people to use the trial garden as a resource, even as trials are actively going. Um, and just to be able to see those plants side by side, I think it's 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 unique in that, um, like Chicago Botanic Garden as well, it's unique um, for gardens to have that trialing process be so front and center and for people to have access to it. A lot of times it is kind of hidden away in the back, but um, oftentimes we just want to promote this stuff. We want people to be able to see it. Um, and it, it's a really, it's an important learning space um, from Mount Cuba Center. Yeah, no, that's that's fantastic that people can come out and see it. I would be worried sick if I were you that some someone's going to fall on, on some, yeah. one of the plants or step yeah. on something because they don't see it there. I would be like just dreading that that was going to happen. But uh, Yeah, I mean, it's stuff like that. It happens, I think. Um, the, the trial garden, the way it's set up, it's almost like an agricultural system. I mean, everything, there's paths through it. Um, everything's really, there's signs on every single plant. Um, it's very clear where things are and aren't. Um, when you get into the naturalistic gardens, that's where there's things like, I won't go anywhere in our naturalistic gardens without that gardener with me. Because mm -hmm. I don't want to step on anything I shouldn't be stepping on. Mm -hmm. I, you, know, you know, something might be coming up. Um, but, um, you know, but it happens. We're a public space. Um, we're inviting people into the garden. But I think that the payoff is so much greater that you're, you're able to educate people and people are able to see that garden and learn about these plants. Um, if there's, you know, if there's a little bit of damage here and there, um, I think that's, it's just part of it. And um, yeah. I like that though, because if you try, if you're trialing garden plants, gardens have human interaction. Mm -hmm. um, sure. So Absolutely. why shouldn't the trial gardens have human interaction? For, for for better or for worse it's sure. that's that's the conditions they're going to be going into more than likely as you move forward anyway yeah. so yeah. so awesome yeah. are there any other places that are doing something like this elsewhere in the country yeah there are uh, chicago botanics really uh, to me one of the most important trial programs in this country it's it's um richard hockey and the work he's doing there is um we we based heavily our our program off of him and what he's been doing there um, I think the plant select program in at Denver um, is is fabulous as well. Obviously, different climate, but a great resource for people who are in the Rockies um, and in Western U.S. Um, yeah, it's interesting. There's a there are a lot of trial gardens out there, um, but oftentimes their re their research isn't published or talked about, especially when you're talking about it from a nursery standpoint. Um, so a lot of these these um, bigger companies, bigger nurseries, particularly those who are doing a lot of breeding and trying to introduce more cultivars, 90% of what they're, what they're producing is never going to see the light of day and it's never going to be talked about because it's their goal is to introduce things. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's really fun to talk about what worked, but also what didn't work. And I think yeah. um, those trials are, are not as common, I will say. Yeah, that's the, the Thomas Edison quote where he had like the 10,000 ways and it's like, Oh, do you found the one way to no, I found 10,000 ways to not make a light bulb. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. It's just as important as the actual yeah. solution. Yeah. Sometimes it feels that way. Our, our <laughs> Alenian trial felt that way. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any other questions? The last one I really had was, was how do people volunteer with you guys? Yeah. If they, they're in the area and they want to be, be a pollinator counter, they want to help out in some way, how can they get in contact with you to, to help volunteer? Yeah, um, it's, I think it's a pretty easy process. We get that person in touch with our volunteer coordinator or just myself and I'll pass the information along. But we're always interested if someone's passionate, if they want to learn about um, native plants, if they want to be involved in the trial garden, particularly the pollinator watch team. Um, there's always room for people like that. Um, there's a whole team we have called the Garden Warriors, which is this whole volunteer crew that goes around the gardens in rotation um, and our gardeners can sign up for their help if they're, you know, if they're working on a big space, if they need, you know, if they need help um, cutting back a border or, you know, cleaning up in the spring or mulching. Um, there's, there's lots of opportunities in the garden like that. And also in the research um, arena as well, not just for my team, but in other pieces of uh, other research projects that we're working on as well. That's awesome, we, 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 um, we've talked about we, we've talked about people that don't have mm. land of their own that that want to get involved. This is a great way where you can roll up your sleeves a little bit and and, and get involved and be a part of it. Absolutely. But that's fantastic. And, it, and if you haven't visited, you have to visit. I've been there. I haven't oh, seen yeah. the trial garden. So, so I'm going to have to go back now. So, yeah. That's, You're welcome. That's Anytime. Um, you know, a lot of people ask me when the best time um, to come to Mount Cuba is. 
Um, if you really like, if you're into spring ephemerals, um, we often have a um, wild, we have a wildflower event, which is essentially an open house or has been in the past and end of April, great time to be there. Um, I love the summer for, you know, those, those big, beautiful, showy perennials um, that are in bloom, particularly in the meadow. But I think my favorite time is fall. And we are open from, um, from April through about Thanksgiving. Um, fall is my favorite time of year. Mm -hmm. So it looks yeah, like I know what I'm doing soon. It's stunning here. And I, I know Nate probably talked about this, but they've opened the natural lands for the first time this year. And that's been a fantastic, that's a fantastic added experience for guests to go experience that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I'm making a fall trip. Yeah, there you I go. think I Sold. am too. <laughs> Sold. Yeah. That, so we always end this uh, with the same question. We do a, a final question and then a final thought. Um, and the, the last question is always the same question. And it's what is your favorite native plant? Oh, now, now here's the really thing. Hard. I, out, of, out of over 50 guests, maybe one person gave us one plant. So you're allowed to, <laughs> yeah. to explain okay. on, on that. Sure. Um, there's a couple genera that I couldn't go without, and I'll just I'll just name a couple. And I'll I'll cheat. Yeah. I'll just a couple, but like that's fine. That's fine. I love Amsonia and Baptisia. I love those two genera. Just I mean, long lived plants. You get tons of value out of them in a garden space. Um, love them, uh, and I think Pycnanthemum has got to be in my top. You know top perennials of all time. I, I like them all for different reasons. We're actually planning a pycnanthemum trial after the Brenoni. Ooh, ooh. Uh, that's but particularly for the, the pollinator activity on yeah. pycnanthemum is just out of this world. And we I want to take a, a deeper dive into that in particular, but mm -hmm. I, pycnanthemums are great. That's that's a lot of a lot of people love pycnanthemum. I love yeah. Amphonia as well. That's that's that is one of my favorite plants. The only reason I didn't pick that because where we're located, it's not native. Sure. That, that's the only reason I didn't. But I love that's one of those plants where every time I walk by it, I have to touch it. Yes. I, I have to yeah. I have to put my hand down and wave my hand through it. So sure. Um, yeah. So we we always kind of finish up with a final thought. We'll, we'll throw it to you. Tom and I will do this as well. But we 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 give you the floor. We give you a, a few minutes. You can use it however you want. If you want to promote something, if you want to summarize or mention something that we haven't mentioned, you can use it however you want. And we're going to hand it over, and the floor is yours. Sure. Um, I guess I'll just take the opportunity to to kind of tell you what's going on or what's gonna um, what's coming down the pipe in the next few years. Um, Really, again, really excited about our hydrangea trial. We're wrapping that up now. I'm starting to write that report, identifying the top performers that'll be research that'll be uh, featured in that report. That's going to be fascinating. The pollinator component of that's going to be great. Um, we already have some great take-home messages, um, not just from our findings from the pollinator watch team, but also um, Deb Delaney, Dr. Delaney from the University of Delaware, did some work on that trial as well. So we'll be giving you a little bit more in-depth look at the pollinator activity on that trial, which is, is really, really cool. Um, some neat findings there. Um, but we're gonna, we're gonna continue the theme of the woody, of woody plants. Um, and the next trial we're gonna do after hydrangea arborescence is hydrangea corsifolia. And this is the first time we're looking at a single species where we have a wild type plant um, from our collection of known origin. And we're gonna compare 21 or 22 different cultivars to it, um, both from a garden perspective and from a pollinator perspective. Um, so that's going to be really fun. Um, the other thing that's going on, uh, so we have the CAREX trial. That's It's wrapping up with actually our last year data, and we're going to come out with a research report in 2022, early 2023. And we're going to follow that up with firms, and we might do a little, um, a little uh, sampling of Tiarella as well, which I'm really excited about. Ooh, nice. I kind of want the other side of that that story as well. And ferns are just, you know, they're another workhorse in the garden like Carex. Um, I think it's really worth having those two in our trial program under our belt. Um, Bernonia is going to wrap up 2023, 2024, and we're going to follow that with Pycnanthemum. Very, very excited about that. Um, there's, I mean, just fabulous plants, fabulous pollinator plants. And then after Soledago, we're looking at doing grasses. Um, so again, ferns and grasses, oftentimes our trials have been genera based. And we're getting a little bit into broader categories, um, which is really fun. And I think eventually, maybe somewhere down the line, we might be trialing combinations of plants, um, giving people oh, very interesting, um, almost like what you do when you give you know a a, um, a seed mix um, or a species mix for different conditions. You know, these are some of our past performers. 
when you use them in a system, this is how it behaves. You know, this is how as a you know as a garden over time. Um, so I think that's you know way off in the future. Who knows when that'll be? But um, it's something I you know think about and I get excited about. And there's you have some things in the pipeline I'm really excited oh, about. Yeah. Like that <laughs> last thing you mentioned is very interesting to me. The ferns uh, and the tiarella both. Mm -hmm. Like I, I perked up a little bit when you mentioned that. So sure, <laughs> yeah, I, some exciting I, stuff. Yeah, um, I'm I'm really looking for. I mean, sometimes I'm like, oh, I got really excited about Rudbeckia, and then I look at the year that we have it slated for. I'm like, ah, it's gonna be a little while. <laughs> we'll get there. Uh, it's there's so many things we want to do, and it's, it, we'll um we'll get to them. But that gives you something to look forward to. You, you exactly. get closure right. on the past ones, and you get to look forward to the next one. So it would be Absolutely. horrible if you, you had closure and then it ended. <laughs> yes, yes, for sure. I don't think that'll ever happen. <laughs> Tom, would you like to go? Or would yeah, you like me to go? yeah, I could take it. And um, so we talk all the time about how much we've changed as we start this podcast. Not just how the podcast has changed, but how Fran and I have changed our opinions. And when I started, uh, for probably really when I got in the industry, I was on the train that, yeah, maybe cultivars probably don't have a place and definitely not an ecological rest, rest, restoration. But I was like, hey, even if you're gardening, why, why not use what's probably the best? And over time, as I've learned more about cultivars, especially through the Mount Cuba trials and realized, oh, well, wow, these are basically straight species plants. They're just selected from a certain area. It's not necessarily that they're a, a completely different thing. They aren't a mutant like you kind of made to feel in uh, a lot of the the Facebook groups and all that yeah. kind of stuff. If you bring up a cultivar, you will get attacked in a yes, lot of these places. Oh, yeah. And uh, they really aren't that bad. So I've started to adopt some of that kind of stuff and say, yeah, if like uh, I just this past year, I had some, uh, oh, I'm, I'm going to mess up the name now. I'm trying to say how you did, Sam. Minarda Didyma? Oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you got all the letters. <laughs> but so I had some of that already, and then I put in some Jacob Klein just because oh, oh, I'd love to see more hummingbirds out here. That's one thing that is missing. I get tons of butterflies, tons of bumblebees, tons of sure. beetles, all kinds of stuff. I don't really get many hummingbirds in at least in our front garden. So that was something that I added uh, in hopes that I get some of that. So yeah, I think there's a place for both, and there's there shouldn't be a fine line like a lot of people right. want to draw. There's a really a line in the sand. That's not the case. Why not use both? Especially when we're close enough, we have a great resource right here that's giving us that, that information. I don't have to figure it out myself. I just wish that more places were doing it and making it front facing so that people in the upper Midwest and the Southeast had that information too yep. and, uh, and could utilize it as well. Tom, you need Absolutely. to get yourself a good Latin book. I do. <laughs> There's one listener in particular who will get that that's an inside joke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, Tom, you, you stole my final thought. So what you and I are very much thinking on the on the same path. And, and I was I started to laugh at some point to myself during this, because if you were to go back and take sound bites of me talking about cultivars versus straight species, it would sound like I'm having an argument with myself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, if you were to piece it all together. It, it would be a, a really good debate. And I think that's because it's like you said, there's not a fine, there, there, there's not a distinct line. Mm -hmm. There's, there's definitely factors at play when looking at it. And part of it is just growth in, in looking at this matter that there is no black and white. There's a lot of gray and, exactly. um, and, and that's part of it for ecological restoration. I would love to see straight species for that seedling diversity, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and the, the genetic diversity over time to be able to adapt to certain conditions, but not everyone is doing ecological restoration. Uh, sometimes they just want their property to look pretty. And if, if you can get them to be a part of what we're trying to accomplish, and it can be with a cultivar, then how is that wrong? It, it you really can't be. And I think some of this is just my personal growth over time. And, and yet you've heard me say, I think that cultivars are a big business and if people didn't buy as many, maybe they would focus more on other things, but, and maybe there are too many, maybe if, if there were less, it would be a much easier conversation to be had. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I really think that whatever gets you turned on to thinking native and an ecological function and just what's best for for wildlife on your property or or even yourself <laughs> if you're choosing a cultivar over an invasive if you're walking into your local box store and you're you're choosing 
um, by Burnham Dent Tatum. Um, trying to think of a cultivar, Chicago Blue Muffin. Or Blue or Muffin. Chicago yeah. Yeah. Instead of taking yeah. Crimson Pygmy Barberry, which is going to be available there, mm-hmm. you know, that's a win in in my book. So yeah. I'll take Absolutely. those those little victories, and and we need to make the circle bigger. And if that's the way to do it then that's a tool at our disposal oh, yeah. to, to use. So why, why overlook that tool? So right. there, there's worse tools in our toolbox. Mm-hmm. I would, I would love <laughs> to, to be able to use that one. So that's my final thought. Tom said it better. <laughs> <laughs> fewer, fewer words for him. That's, yes. that's the big thing. It's fewer I, words. I, and <laughs> I, you know, I had to, during our talk last night, Tom was saying you have one mouth and two ears. So which one, which one should you use more? And I'm like, could you imagine if I had two mouths in one year? <laughs> That's what goes through my head while we're doing these. <laughs> well, no, this was a great time and that's going to wrap it up. Um, thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed listening to Sam Hoadley of Mount Cuba Center. Uh, for more information, visit mountcubacenter.org and thank you everyone for listening to native plants healthy planet presented by pylons nursery uh we're giving a thank you to the egocentric plastic men for contributing our theme music make sure sure you uh stream or buy their music wherever you consume your music apple music spotify uh live music is back and i know they're playing live gigs so if you're in the philadelphia area i know they play a lot of gigs in maniunk go see them live uh you can follow us on twitter at pineland nursery facebook at pinelands nursery and instagram at pinelands nursery uh, or native plants underscore healthy planet and YouTube at Pinelands Nursery. You know, it's funny. I, I forget about this all the time, but you mentioned last night, there is a Pinelands Nursery in Florida. So yes, make sure yeah. you don't just type in Pinelands Nursery. You may not be getting the right one when you're going, what? when did they start selling palm trees? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so, so make sure you, you follow the correct links. Um, we do have our question and answer line. You can call us at 215-346-6189. I will repeat that. It is 215-346-6189. Uh, call in and ask a question or leave a comment. When we play it on a future episode of Buzz, we will answer it to the, the best we can. Or we'll have uh, we'll call a friend uh, to help us answer it. Um, and Saul has been absent the last couple of weeks, but he did call in. We're a little worried about him just because he's – not as hyper as normal it was a more laid back laid back Saul so we'll yeah. we'll uh oh, yeah. check in with him and see what he's been up to um and let's not forget about the native plants healthy planet Facebook group a ton every time we we talk about this it's a ton of new members mm-hmm. we're up well over the 500 mark now and uh, a lot of great new interaction and feedback so we love seeing that and keep it going over there so we now have t-shirts and you can find them at www.nativeplantshealthyplant.com. There's a banner at the top. And just as a reminder, we aren't taking a dime from those t-shirts. All the no. money that is made in profits from those t-shirts, we have to pay for the actual shirt. But uh, everything on top of that, that's built in that price is going to organizations that we've had on the podcast to support the amazing work that they are doing. Um, and you can find all different kinds of designs. There's a couple more that I have to, to put up there still. Um so there's some new stuff coming out. So even if you got a t-shirt, check back because there's going to be some new things coming out. And uh, and there's a couple that are that are group specific. There's one for the Xerxes Society. There's one for New Jersey Audubon. Uh, there's a couple like that that are, are going directly to those organizations. What's our best selling t-shirt? It is the, I think it's just the, oh, it's one of two. It's okay. either the Keep It Native shirt, which is right. Fran's trademark that he's going to say in about a minute. And um, <laughs> and then there's the the Plant Native Plants one where it just says Plant Native Plants in I, huge block letters across that, the front. That is one of my favorite. Yeah. You know what? It When someone's walking up to you, they know exactly what you're all about. Yeah. I was surprised <laughs> the Eat Native Plants one had not uh, got as much. All those folks that like to eat native plants like me, uh, you need yeah. to get one of those T-shirts as well. So, yeah. I like um, you can listen to our podcast at native Pl- or the native plants healthy planet podcast directly at www.nativeplantshealthyplanet.com same exact website where you buy the t-shirts uh but let's be honest you're probably going to listen to us on apple Podcasts or spotify stitcher podbean really wherever you consume your podcast you can even ask Alexa to play the native plants healthy planet podcast with that thank you everyone i am tom and i am fran thank you again everyone sam thank you so much for taking time out of your day today we really appreciate uh this was a fantastic conversation thank you absolutely thank you guys for having me oh anytime uh coming up uh next week we will have a new buzz episode and again the re- 
the return of Saul. So we'll we'll check in with him. Uh, topic to be determined. Art, we're we're last minute. Sometimes we don't know the topic. Sometimes I don't know the topic <laughs> until we get to the topic portion yeah, yeah. of the podcast. So so, but we have that coming up next week. So make sure you tuned in. Until then, everyone, keep it native. Thank you for listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Remember to like, share, follow, and comment.